Welcome back. So today I didn't really have anything on the agenda. I think I'll just do the usual and participate in some tournaments. Um, in fact, let's do some blitz. Okay. I see there's only 24 minutes left in this tournament, so it's not the best time to join. Uh, I did swap my mouse from uh, home and from the office, so I have a better chance here. I still don't know why the page scrolls and jumps like that. Um, it's certainly not a hardware thing, I want to say, um, because we're at hardware. You think I'd be able to... I mean, unless all my mice are busted the same exact way, which seems unlikely, right? So I'm suspecting it's not a hardware thing. It's got to be some kind of software-driven, I don't know what's causing this page to skip, but something is. So, at least we've ruled out... I'm ruling out hardware. Alright, so we've developed the pieces. We're up uh, bishop. Probably soon to be up more. Maybe going to win a king here in just a second. Depends how reckless my opponent is. Alright, so g2 is targeted. Um, let's just double the rooks. I would form an Eliokin's gun, but it's not going to make it... Uh, Beans worth the difference here. Okay. Um, so if I play c5, things open up pretty nicely. Uh, also, rooks on the other side of the board are pretty cool. Um, here, let's kick the queen. Kick it again and see if we can win this bishop on d6. Um, uh, apparently I'm not winning a bishop. Bummer. On the bright side though, I do get all my pieces lined up on this nice open file aiming toward uh, the opposing king. So I guess there's a silver lining there somewhere. Uh, Alyokin's gun is when you put both of your rooks in front of your queen. Um, so it tends to be absolutely annihilating. Uh, Alright, so we're up a little bit of material. We've got some winning chances here. Um, so let's check him and checkmate. There we go. Oh, one thing I forgot to do was boost the speed of my mouse, of my cursor. So I've enlarged the board, we've moved to a 3D set. It looks beautiful, but it's super unwieldy. So it's going to take some time to get acclimated to uh, these new settings. Um, but you know, it'll be a fun journey. And hopefully I'll make up some of the 50 points I lost yesterday. Uh, so here we go. E4. All right. Play a C3 Sicilian. Oh, I was going to say, I don't know Sicilian that well. Oh, wait, I'm playing a 1400. Okay, I don't need to be so afraid in this case. In fact, let's throw caution to the wind. So d5 can't be achieved there. Um, but all kinds of other things can happen in this position. I've discouraged d5, and as long as I'm not hanging my d4 pawn, this development's okay. Um, it's sure is a pity I don't have another piece in the center right now. One more piece would be very useful. I'm trying to apply pressure on e6. If he plays h6, I might just take it. And he takes my knight, I take his knight, he takes back, I take back, he does queen takes, and I take on uh, g5. Um, okay, makes sense he wants to close the position. I think I'll just cast some 
Now if h6. Uh, I'm going to run like a coward. And develop another piece, and then strike with f4. Here we go. So he's going to move his knight at d7 as soon as he finds a place to move it to. In the meantime, I do want to complete my development and try to centralize as many pieces as possible. Um, okay, let's overprotect this pawn. Well, <laughs> it's not overprotection unless he sacks the rook. Um, two defenders, two attackers is not overprotection. Uh, okay. I'm going to guess that he's going to capture my knight. I guessed incorrectly. Impressive. Um, Alright, so we'll protect the e-pawn. Now see, yep, now okay, now he took. A lot of players do like to exchange uh, pieces when it's unclear what to do. And because it's easier to manage a position that doesn't have so many pieces in it. On the other hand, each time you exchange, you're likely conceding something to your opponent who wanted that exchange to happen. Likely. Not always. Um, if queen g5, I just take the queen. Okay, he does see that. If knight f4, I take the knight. So he's probably going to play g5 to try to get this knight moving. Oh, he's not going to do that. Never mind. Alright, so we'll just keep developing. My bishop is kind of awkward on account of where all my other pieces are located. Um, let's just get the other rook in. So I'm up in exchange. I have a rook for his knight. Um, yeah. And we'll just play this position and see where we go. Okay. Um, Let's hit this pawn. Maybe I should have hit that earlier. I was kind of concerned about things that were moving on the king's side, so I kept my queen positioned toward the king's side, but maybe I didn't need to do that. Oh, this is actually a good way to hit this for a couple of reasons. Um, the least of which is that I could just take it if he completely ignores what I'm doing. But the better point is that if he tries to defend this, then I can hit h6, and suddenly I've got some pressure. Um, okay, but yeah, he wants my bishop. Uh, oh, actually, he gets my pawn. That's interesting. Um, okay. Now is he going to take my bishop? We Alright, computer is binging to let me know that I am running low on storage space. Um, what? He's not winning any material here. He's just exchanging material in a position where he's worse. I don't understand that. You know, if he... okay. Um... So this is how we keep a rook out of the game. Um, if I can get more pieces pointed toward his king, this position improves even more. So let's just see how many pieces we can aim in that general direction. Um, check. And check to your king. As one chess whiz would say. And then check to your king again. And there's the checkmate. Alright. So it's good to see that the mouse works. I still don't know what in the world is up with my browser plugin. Why my page scrolls every time it loads. Uh, some of these are some of life's great mysteries. Oh, I usually actually just play... Oh. Okay. 
I can actually take this. It's not so bad. I'm not familiar with this line. This really caught me off guard. Um, all right, I'm going to castle. He's going to harass my bishop before I get a chance to play. Oh, he's not. Let's see. Now I've got bishop f1 if I want it. Um, free pawn. Free pawn is so free here. Um, okay. Yeah, now your, your queen could take that. I really wouldn't bring my queen out this early. That's almost a matter of preference. Um, but not really in cases where bad things happen. Um, so, yeah, I prefer my development by far. Okay, I guess this does, um, huh, okay, he's going, I don't know this, um, variation so well. This is looking sketchy to me. I mean, he could take b2 if I do that, so I'm not sure if I care for that variation. Yeah, I'm trying to tr no, the queen goes to a5 if I play a3, and then from a5 it goes back to d8. So his bright idea was that he's hitting my f2 pawn. Um, I think what he's not accounting for is that I wanted to move some of my pieces anyway. Um, It didn't make sense to let the queen keep harassing this b-pawn. Alright, so... I guess here I play one of my rooks to c1, probably get out of the way of this stuff. Um... Oh. Well, in hindsight that's kind of obvious. Especially if you know this opening. Um. Hmm. That's a bother. Okay, fine. You want to play that way? We'll, we'll play that way. Check. Alright, so I got my pawn back. Uh, I'm losing a bishop. Or an exchange. Guess I'm gonna lose an exchange. So now I've got one of each piece, but he's gonna win my e pawn. He's really a, playing well. Um, and that's kind of to be expected of a player with a decent rating. You could take my a pawn, um, because my fork here doesn't do anything. Um, You could also let me make some threats. Case in point. And then we double down on that, and that's just game. So he was too hasty to collect uh, there. I think this is why he's 1900. He didn't pace himself as well as he could have. Uh, he played a lot of good moves. For sure he played well, but uh, was not enough to win this game. Snuffy checks me again, I just take the rook, otherwise we do this. Man, my computer, I can still hear that churning. I'll have to see if I can do something about that. Okay, so you got a King's Gambit declined. Um, 
Okay, now we've transposed into... Ooh. I was going to say I've seen this before, but I've not seen E5 here. This is new territory. Um... Okay. My knight looks defended out here. Okay, now I just gain a tempo. Wow. Okay, am I calculating this correctly? Sir? Sir? Okay. Sure. So I'm up a rook. Obviously that doesn't last, but I'm up something that does last. Okay, so wait a second. That's a free knight. That is a free knight. He's not even going to try to take my knight. Okay. That works. Works for me. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened that game. All I am sure of is I'm in 17th place, and I'm on a winning streak. All right. Uh, let's scroll that back into place. Um, yeah, I'm just going to blame the scrolling page on my computer being haunted or some nonsense like that. So, c5 seems thematic, uh, trying to undermine my center. I don't know about this. I don't know. Um, there's so many things I don't know here. I'm going to castle. I guess we're going to liquidate. Um... Okay, I'm going to back up. The so sea pawn will serve as something of an anchor here. Um, I'm not entirely sure what's going on. Alright, my rook's not making it very far in the A file with the queen there, so we'll transfer to the D file. Um, and exchange a rook and play the other rook forward. All right, do some more exchanges. Oops, there goes my bishop. Um, well, no, I can't even check him. No, that's just game. All right, well, uh, that's what happens when I get bored. Yeah, knight takes uh, d1 was slightly preferable to queen takes d1. That's really all there is to that. Um, so that's why I'm 2043 and not like 2060 or something like my opponent. Just didn't have the patience to go through and actually play that game. All right, let's play something more exciting. Castle. Okay, d5. a3 is surely coming. Um, or bishop d2 or something. It's got to somehow respond to the fact that I'm playing aggressively. Um, this looks fun. Let's try it. It looks unsound, but also fun. So my point is I can take there and not really so much double the pawns as just give him an isolated pawn. Oh, bishop d3. That I didn't consider. Um, 
That I can't counter with bishop f5. I have to play pawn f5 instead. Uh, which kind of ruins my position. Just a bit. Okay. Um, oh, that would be a way to hang stuff now, wouldn't it? Aye, so my everything hangs if I'm not careful. Um, being careful here is hard. Oh, jeez. Wow, what a mess. I think I'm hanging a pawn by force. And that's if I try to hold it. So, yeah, lesson of the day. Um, if you're playing risky openings, um, try to play the book moves. Because non-book moves will lead to positions you regret. Like, when I took there on c3, um, I saw the potential for this bishop to get outside the pawn chain. What I didn't evaluate properly is just how awful my piece placement is. Um, this kind of sets a new low for just how you can misplace your pieces. And he's got a wide open shot on the long diagonal. My f pawn's loose. My bishop has pretty much nowhere to go because my pawn's in the way. That's where I would have wanted to put my bishop, but it's just not going to work out there. Um, I guess my queen has to go to the long diagonal. Just okay until he kicks it with his bishop. And then I have to find somewhere else to go, but I can't go to h4 because the knight controls h4. I can't stay on the d-file because the rook's there. Um, if I go to g6, he's just going to play knight h4. But what else do I do? Because I don't want to get my queen pinned. Here at least it supports the e4 knight. But... Oh. Okay. Now we're cooking with gas. Well, at least there's something for me to hope for here. Um... Oops, I just dropped a pawn. It's not the worst pawn drop, though, because... Actually, I get the C pawn in return. Um... <sighs> what a mess. Now you could play knight e6, but now I've got that covered. You could play queen takes queen. But now he doesn't have any way to hit my g pawn. Which is weak, he just doesn't have any way to get to it. Um, I have to go back. Keep my e6 square protected. I could take the pawn here. It's a sad day when I go pawn grabbing like that, though. Um, Jeez. I am in time trouble. Just in time for the end of the tournament. Okay, let's try to develop. If knight a7, I can... Oops. Okay, well, we're going to take this now. Um... Rook a5, nope, that's not rook a5. Okay, we hit the rook knight. I say rook because I'm intending a shot at his back rank, not because I'm actually hitting the rook. He's got to do a lift there, and I still push and I push. Uh, I'm going to take this knight. 
And this does not count for tournament standings any longer. Just for pride. Cool. Well, that was close. Let's see how we did. 23rd place. 12 points. Uh, well, that's a result. Um, it's definitely a result. Um, I don't want to join in the last couple minutes of that 3-0 here. Here's a 3-2 that's going to go on for another half hour or so. Maybe that would be appropriate. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And 40 minutes. On the other hand, we're not too far away from first here. So, hmm. unfortunately, it seems like um, I missed the pairing wave. I think pairings tend to happen in waves in these tournaments where whole groups of players all get paired at the same time. And if you miss the wave, you're just like waiting for a pairing until groups of players all finish around the same time. The advantage of a wave-based system is that um, if you have few players, um, it helps guarantee that all the players will have pairings around the same time. If you have lot, and they'll have good pairings, um, but if you have lots of players in an event, um, then waves where you have to wait X minutes for the next wave, um, even though they increase pairing quality a little bit, they uh, may impair a person's ability to get paired. But here we're only talking about like 10 people or 16. Um, so that's not too many. Yeah, I'm not quite up for an hour long tournament so I'm joining this one that's an hour and ten minutes, but I'm joining it in a half hour late. You saw the clock started there at 40 minutes, and it's ticking down. Along with it, ticking down are my chances to win. Oh well. <laughs> you know what would be cool? is if you end up waiting multiple minutes to get a pairing, if it would just like increment your tournament score with like one point and a point and a point and a point uh, and so forth, just so you have some chance of getting paired with somebody who's doing well. Um, oh, pairing. How about that? 1944. He's no slouch. Um, let's play Sicilian. That's what all the cool people are playing. Let's try to be cool. All right. Knight takes. There we go. Knight c3. Maybe. Are we going to see knight takes knight? Yep, knight c3, and then knight db5. Either he's not seen this before, or something's up. But given the duration he's taking, I've got to assume he's probably not seen this before, or something near his computer or someone in his family, or who knows what, may be distracting. It's knight d5, yep, bishop takes, pawn takes. This is all theory. c3, intending knight c2, and knight e3, and taking 
charge of the F5 square. Uh, that's not book. That is definitely not book. Don't know why. Um, I just know that's nothing I've seen before. Well, I guess for one thing, I can push b4. Um, and then I have to push a5 to support it, and I can get my bishop out this way. And say I don't even need to push f5. Oh, you don't like this board. Let me know if there's some combination of set and 3D board that works better. Um, I know this does look different, but of all the free, uh, freely available sets and boards, this one seemed to work the best and most resemble an actual tournament playing board. Um, oh, here we go. Yeah, I'm not going to let that bishop loose. Um... Am I missing something really critical here? Like, how is this any good for white? Okay, so he's threatening h4. So I'm going to play my bishop back to h6 here. Okay, now if I do queen d7, I'm threatening mate, basically. So, he better have something planned. Oh, I can't take on g4. Okay, fine. Um, this is going to get ugly. If you didn't think it was ugly already, this is going to get ugly. Um, Alright, so I'm going to keep trying to control this g5 square. And I am just going to get the most savage beatdown ever. Um, but you can't fault me for trying. Okay. Um. <laughs> okay, I'm sacking this B pawn. And he's not even taking it. Okay. Um. I guess I'll take that. And I don't even know where I'm going next. Um. I guess I'm willing to exchange lots of things and sack my h6 bishop. This is really weird. Um, but no, I can't take on d5. Taking d5 was part of my plan to reduce some of this tension. But that doesn't seem wise here. Um, it seems the opposite of wise. Okay, let's try to develop this way. Okay, my queen has a7. He's 
I don't think he has G5 anymore, because he doesn't have a rook to support this. Um, I'm not taking his knight anymore. I might have done it earlier, but without rooks to support his attack, what's he got? He's got some kind of ghost of an attack at this point. Um, I guess I have a queen that's running around. Um, if I could get my bishop to e8 and move my knight, I could trap a queen. Um, oh, he's attacking f6. Okay. Um, so I guess my new plan is to move the bishop to d7 or c8 still. C8 is still the plan. I just want to get my queen active while his queen isn't going very far. Um, I'm not even trying to win the queen or anything. I just want to use my queen to attack stuff. Um, So my queen can still attack stuff in this formation. Um, I forgot we had an increment. That actually does change the dy game dynamic quite a bit. Um, okay, I need my king over here. Um, Let's hit this knight. Broken up his pawns. Um, he's trying to support his pawn going to h6. It's just not going to happen in a way that favors him. I might stand corrected. I might stand very corrected on that. Uh, okay, well, I seem to be out of time. Arg. I had no time on my clock at the time I made that move. And I can resign that without a guilty conscience or anything. So, so yeah, number two player is pretty good. Um, I evidently have a thing or two to learn. Uh, wow. So, I mentioned I was learning the Sicilian. That was, by sh for sure, a trial by fire. Um, I've not seen B or C4 played there, but to have such a strong player, strong opponent playing such an opening, it must be okay. I mean, it beat me, so it can't be too terrible, but, um, as for whether or not I'd actually play it, I'm, jury's still out there. Alright, so check. Um, I was going to do bishop g4. Uh, 
I don't really care. Now he castles and I have to take c6, or my pawns get fragmented, which might be okay here. Um, either way, now I have to take that. Um, I'm going to break this pin. Yeah, I know we can double my pawns, but I'm not so afraid. Um, so he's getting two. He has the bishop pair, and they're pretty effective here. Um, I have flubbed this opening very badly. Oh, now he just plays d3. Um, and my position collapses. I uh, probably shouldn't have allowed that. Even castling and hanging the b-pawn would have been smarter than what I just did here. Yeah. So... Yeah, I am kind of out of ideas here. I guess I'll move to the open file. Thanks for the feedback. Uh, please try to provide constructive feedback. Thank you very much. Um, no, I've been looking through all the 3D boards and uh, 3D sets, and I haven't found one that looks better than this. And Twitch kind of insists that streamers have to stream at 3,000 um, kilobits per second. So if I'm going to be streaming at a bitrate um, that has, I don't know, that's basically the same that they use for first-person shooter games and such, I might as well make an attempt to make it look interesting. I'm not going to do the same thing every time. Um, I'm sure sometimes I'll use the 2D sets. It's just, what's the point? If people aren't going to be able to watch it um, on a mobile connection anyway, I don't know. I'll, I'll keep experimenting with the three sets and see if I think of something. Um, but this seems to be the best one that's available. I spent far longer than I should have trying to make this look nice. Uh, so constructive feedback would be appreciated. Um, Where is my knight going? Uh, d4 might be okay. H, no, h2, it's kind of sketchy, but kind of works. Um, no, but really, his threats on my back rank are just destroying me here, so I better do stuff about this. Yeah, no, he's come in this channel before and trolled me before. So, I'm not afraid to mince words with them. I don't want to give the illusion that I'd do that with everybody, but... Um... Jeez, this... what a position. Alright. Uh, so, yeah, this bishop pair stuff is just fantastic stuff, isn't it? All my pieces are in exactly the wrong squares for this position. It's just amazing. Alright, so, I'm moving my knight, which means that my h-pawn is loose. Um... Here, let's give myself a flight square, because he's going to try to checkmate me. Um, so I'm going to attempt to build a fortress, and 
fight off whatever threats he has with the last seconds of my increment clock. Um, the further up the board I can block this, the better. So let's take that, plonk the knight there, and then defend it, and see how well I do here. Um. Oops, well shit, I just hung a pawn. Well, at least he's not paying attention. So, there's that. I got really lucky here. So now if I can pick off the h6 pawn, I have some drawing chances. Prior to that, this was looking pretty terrible. Um, uh, shit, how do you play this? I don't even have a good waiting move. Like, bishop c7 just lets him walk in with king c5. But, if my. Oh, shit. Why am I so bad at this game? Um. Yep, now he plays bishop d3. I can't move my king back. So my king has to go this way. If I play king g4, he just moves his bishop back. Or he's volunteering to do that. Um, this should not be possible for white to hold. Now suddenly I've got some chances. Um, Uh, it's not to say I've got this by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, no, it's just lost. Well, damn, these guys are good. I mean, I'm sucking, but they're not just rolling over. I mean, you saw the previous tournament where we played without an increment. And those guys would just roll over in basically any, op well, a variety of openings and endgame positions. That fellow did blunder a couple times in the endgame, but I returned the favor. Um, I allowed that fork of my minor pieces, but maybe I was zugzwanged anyway. I get the fe uh, the feeling that this sea bass fellow really enjoys trolling because he just doesn't have anything else in his life. Um, so the book move is d6. So we're gonna play d6. Oh wait, I forgot my opponent's twenty one forty three. So either I I don't know I can't explain um, how some player so high rated comes up with this particular arrangement of pieces. Um, something is unusual. Something unusual is afoot here.
So now f7 is loose. Can I just sack on f7? I feel like I can. Bishop takes, king takes, queen d5, king g6, uh, rook g4. This has got to be good, right? Oh my god. I've played this before. The same sacrifice. And then he blocks on e6 with the rook. Okay, well, <laughs> um, this is going to take some ingenuity to survive. Um, hmm. I just don't know. I'm suffering from chest blindness against opponents who are playing some interesting moves. Um... I must have done one too many chess tactics. And I'm thinking that like every position I could just sacrifice something and the rest just works itself out. Which obviously is not the case. So knight g5, bishop there, queen h5, king g8. Oh, but that actually works. I'm not seeing how this fails, so I'll need him to show me. It's probably just king g6 or something. Um, no, I don't think that works. So I'm down two pieces. But if king g8, I mate. And what else does he have here? Oh, how did I get this background? Like the black background here? Or are you referring to something else? Uh, I've got several user styles in effect either way. Um, to try to make Lee Chess look a little bit easier to read, in my opinion. Um. I guess I'll just develop my rook. Something really weird happened this game, and I'm not sure what. Oh, the neon letters. Yeah, all of that is my own user style. Um, which I think makes all the text... I don't know. Like, if you're using Leech Us with the dark style without any kind of coloring... It looks pretty bland. Um, so I spent quite a bit of time uh, trying to color this to make it look nicer. Okay. Um, we won a game. Cool. So it, I don't know. It sacrifices some usability, I guess. Because so many things are colored so brightly. Uh, a lot of people find it distracting, but I find it, I don't know, entertaining and warm in some way. Yeah, well, it applies this thing called a user style. So, modern browsers, I guess since last decade, if not earlier, have allowed you to um, write your own cascading style sheets or CSS that determine how to style these pages. How, what fonts to use, what font sizes to use, what font colors to use, what dimensions to use for just about everything, and um, you go on down the line. There's all kinds of customizations, and each browser had their own independent way of saying, make this particular aspect of a page look this way that's ever so slightly nicer and such. Uh, eventually, the major browser developers got together, uh, conferred upon um, just some more generic ways of styling pages. Uh, so they, that's where the that's where style sheets came from. Um, is that there was a standard for determining various styles that could be applied to a page. Then later on, browsers um, came up with better tools for helping 
people develop their own styles. Um, even from within the browser, you didn't need to have a program like front page to tell you how to make a web page and style it. Um, so, um, and then some people have developed tools that allow you to share your various styles, not just for a single browser, not for just a single like email or something, but to just publish them online and provide feedback and search these various styles that have been produced and they're cross browser compatible and such. Um, it's technology, you wouldn't understand it. Uh, it's a bit beyond you. It's like 21st century. Don't worry about it. What you do need to know is that you just like go to a website, type in stylish, and you hit a button, and then you hit another button, and you keep hitting buttons until it works. Now, it's possible the word button there might be a bit advanced too. I'm not sure. Oh man. It seems like Kotov himself can't believe that I won a game and isn't willing to give me a pairing. <laughs> uh, uh, he's like, uh, you lost your first two games. Then you won game number three, but I don't approve of the way in which you won the game. So I'm not going to give you a next opponent. No, but seriously, is this page still online? Yeah, it's still there. Chat window's still here. El Internet Mui Malo. I, I don't know a whole lot of Spanish, but I'm going to say... His <laughs> pardon me. I'm gonna say his internet is full of apples. That's clearly what that means. Uh, Six thousand log probably means that he's drinking a ton of beer. Uh, I don't know. It's a very poetic language. All right, so we got a good opponent. Let's play good if we can. All right, so C3. Oh, are we going to play the same opening we just saw last game? Except this time I'm going to get to actually show the line that you're supposed to play. D5. All right. Rook E1. Rook E1. We're going to go into the main. Yes. Rook takes E4. Bishop G5. Are we not going into this? Oh man. I thought we were going to get something theoretical. And maybe we are. But no, I'm kind of out of the frying pan at this point. So into the fire we go. No, I just... If he's improved upon the main line, by all means, um, I am completely screwed here, but odds are I'm probably doing okay. Alright, so I'm going to hang my beep on. He actually takes it. Okay. Um, I seriously did not expect that. That's kind of a huge, huge commitment here. Because, like, everything by both players is hanging in this position. So to even take a single tempo and spend it collecting a pawn is just nuts. I would not do it. Yeah, so he takes pawn number two. I take a pawn threatening f2. He plays his g-pawn forward to kick my knight. Oh. I fell to a stupid, stupid tactic. 
whatever. All right, let's get this over with. I don't have the attention span for this. All right, so let's go take a look at just what went wrong. So there's the opening, there's the middle game. Yeah, by the time he takes the bishop, it's all over. So that's kind of why I just like rolled over there. I'm like, ah, I don't want to play this for another eight minutes or something. Let's just get a new game. Bishop d7 was not the best. Oh, g6 is what I should play here. Yeah, I was just completely at a loss because I've never seen this position before. I've seen lots of positions in this opening, but not this particular one. Um, bishop takes g5 is okay. Okay, so and then knight g6. What's the point? I don't understand what this does. c5, he takes, I take. Moves this rook so he doesn't get forked. I develop. He develops. I play d5. No way in hell I'm going to find this in a blitz game. Um, no, the main line, just for the curious, doesn't go queen b3. In fact, stockfish is not looking too favorably upon this. The main line isn't much better, but it's better. Just not very much. Um, uh, how did this go? Yeah, it's h6, queen e2, pawn takes, rook e1, threatening the knight, Bishop b6, pawn takes, and then rook h3. It's just super theoretical. Um, but who needs theory? Actually, let's withdraw from the tournament, because I'm not going to win that anyway. Um, let's play another game. One more game, that'll wrap it up. Hopefully I'll have the attention span for this one. We'll see. Hm. You know, assuming I get the pairing. That might be a bit much to assume. Alright, let's just go join a tournament for one game of Bullet. That sounds like a reasonable course of action, right? Assuming I get an opponent rated anything near my own rating, I can at least show off that my mouse works. Uh, thanks for the offer. Um, I'm just looking forward to playing one more game here. And then calling that that. Okay. No, oh, he's not taking. So I'll defend. Take. He takes d4. I castle. Okay, we hit the center. Um, I guess take that, develop this. Uh, I don't know where this goes. This is bad. Get the king out of there. If the queen takes, then I'm able to. Uh, oh, that's kind of fun. All right. Okay. So apparently he's not going to let me checkmate on the file there. Um, I hate to do this. I hate to exchange queens when I've got this nice attack going, but I don't have a way to pursue that to the end. Um, so instead I'm going to blockade this pawn. Uh, and then put some more pressure on it. Oh, okay. And then just hang some material just to make things exciting. We all enjoy exciting moves. Okay, and take stuff. And 
Let's see if I can get him to move the rook. Can I get him to move the rook off? There we go. I got him to move the rook. Okay, we'll pin this. Keep the pin. Uh, I'm in huge time pressure. Well, okay. Yeah, I can't even do bullet. So, at least the mouse works. We got that. Um, so, I don't know why, but I feel compelled to analyze this. No, I, I'm compelled because this the way he played this game was atrocious. And I just failed to punish it. Um, but I play pretty badly too, so how much can I really complain about his play? Um, how did we get here? Oh, a fantasy variation with bishop g4. I just panicked. I didn't know if bishop c4 is the line or not. Uh, opening explorer. So we do this, we analyze the one minute game so that when I have a tournament game, um, I don't have to spend 30 minutes looking at a position trying to figure out, oh, my opponent just played something stupid, how do I refute it? Um, we do this with the bullet game so we can figure out what the refutation is after the game. And then make some attempt to remember it for next time. Alright, so now we're back into Gioco Piano territory. Um, yeah, this looks okay. Is this really the best I have? There's c3 here, there's castle here. It all transposes to the same thing. I was just thinking that bishop g4 just looks so outrageous that it, there's got to be some way to bust it. Evidently not, and it's just meh. It's okay. Um, hmm. C3 looks interesting, though. So this defers... Like, they say knights before bishops, right? I just am not sure where I want to put my knights. But if I play C3 first... Yeah, black's probably going to play knight D7. This reduces pressure on the d-pawn. Um, supports a C5 push eventually. Also gets rid of a square... A retreat square for this bishop. So, oh, I'm really tempted to play h3 here. Now, see, knight d7 kind of refutes um, bishop c4 in a lot of variations. So, that's why I want to play like c3 before playing bishop c4. Bishop c4 is kind of committal. Um, but knight d7 makes me think the bishop might actually belong on d3 instead of c4. And masters actually agree, so that's a good thing. And then we develop the bishop and castle, and they play knight f6. We develop our knight. And now we're kind of in Rui territory, uh, I want to say. Um, I mean, the distinction with Gioco Piano, with the bishop on c4 trying to go for some kind of quick skirmish based on pressure on the f7 square and rapid development. Whereas here we've got kicked back into, I guess a Rui would be if our bishop ended up on c2. Here it's on d3, that's ever so slightly different. I don't think it matters. Um, this is comfortable for white. I'll just play h3 now. And then um, I actually want to play queen e1 and a g3, but no, that's kind of silly on account of this bishop. Um, knight c4 looks fun, but okay, you know, knight c4, there's some rationale to it. You could um, move the knight out to um, hit the king side a little bit. Queen c2 is a good developing move on, on principle. That should be done. 
Yeah. Now, does white have better than any of this? Bishop g4 might be reasonable after all. If bishop g4 is reasonable, then it's possible my fantasy variation line... Um... Oh. I'm sorry, I panicked in all of this. I got my move order transposed. I thought the main line here was uh, pawn takes e4, and then bishop g4. But this move ordering doesn't matter. Um, if they play bishop g4 first, and then you develop the bishop, and then if they happen to take, you're still in good territory. I just haven't studied all the other variations where black just doesn't take the pawn. It seems like if he doesn't take, he's in good shape. Um, so yeah, I'm suddenly not liking this variation at all. I'll have to put some more research into this and find something that I want to play against the Karo. Um, for the longest time I used to just play the exchange, and that's no fun. And sometimes I would just play c4, but then they just play e5 against you. So... Yeah, I need a better line to play against the Karo if if this is going to be one of my tournament sorts of openings. Um, but we learned this from a bullet game. Pretty inconsequential game. It only lost me, like, what, how many rating points there? 13? So, that's worth 13 rating points. Yeah, well, the main line's pretty cool. I did study the main lines for a while because I wanted to play this as black, and then I realized, well, no, if I play this, this is going to completely drain my chess game, and, and there's just so many variations where both players know exactly what they're getting out of the opening, and it's just so predictable. And I was looking for something a bit more adventurous, but... Um, the g4 sack makes a lot of sense, but um, that's a more recent invention. I'm just not putting in the time to memorize all that theory. And I know the theory will rapidly evolve over time as well. So I don't want to play something that's really old and really stale. I don't want to play something that's like cutting edge, top of the line, newest theory sort of thing. I want some sort of middle ground. Um, I think that's kind of hard to find with this opening. Maybe I'll just go back to playing the exchange against it. It's more interesting than some of the main lines, in my opinion. Others' opinions may vary, but it doesn't work very well for Bullet. Um, it's just too chaotic. Too difficult to predict what the opponent's going to do. Yeah, no... Wait, is the transposition to the can out thought Vinic forced? Like, so my move order that I'm more familiar with here is C4, takes, takes, and pan out thought Vinic. Um, I don't think that there's a way to force that, though. Like, this is your main line, but if you take here... Okay, this is a Scandinavian, actually, if they refuse. Um, but if they accept, then you can get back into Panov waters. I was going to say, the problem with c4 straight away is e5, and black is better. Um, this pawn on c4 is a liability. But now, if I exchange on d5, uh, if they do queen takes, um, we're in a Scandinavian territory, and that's okay. This is at least something flexible. Why not just d4? Uh, is that not what we're looking at here? I'm not sure I understand the question. But yeah, I think... Um, Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I have low latency mode or something on, so there should only be like a 
two or three second delay. Um, but okay. Right. No, my, my main point with C4, though, is like, um, for sometimes, sometimes I do play the English. Um, I've been trying to make it something of a tournament opening. It's been very frustrating because I've been getting bad positions despite many, many hours of study and practice and memorization and playing games, and I just can't retain it. And even what I can retain is no good against opponents who are well prepared. Um, so, um, so my point here, uh, what was it? That is, I think if people have been playing, I'm getting my move order confused. <sighs> I'm so confused. Because this is the same position we were just looking at. And yet I'm wanting to say that for the English this is a line? I don't know. Yeah, chess is hard. For a while I used to play the bird. That was fun. And then I got lots of bad positions against well-prepared opponents. Gave that up. Um, for a while I played d4 and then just got all these positional things. But my, uh, my playing style is to try to sack on f7, g7, or h7, or just throw everything forward this way. Which tends not to work so well with the idea of positions where the minority attack is what you should be doing. So d4 is really not um, in line with my style. Uh, one thing I could consider would be knight f3. I still have to figure out what to do against this. But then I guess we could transpose into d4 openings and Again, this ends up with stuff that I don't know. Or I just need to learn the Karo proper and figure a way to deal with this. Um, H4. There you go. Karo solved. At least for Blitz Chest, that might be okay. Um, I've done this before. It's pretty ridiculous. Nobody suspects it. Um... I mean, yeah, they play d5, which is good, but I don't know. It's it's a way to keep an opponent on their toes, especially if they're predicting that you're just going to go in the main line with, like, d4, d5, knight c3, pawn takes, knight takes, bishop f5, knight g3, bishop g6, h4, and then either h6 or h5, depending upon... I don't know. Actually, no, it's h6, I believe. And then I think sometimes you do play h5, sometimes you don't. Um, there's other lines where you take, and you could play like knight f6, takes, takes, and he's got the half open g file. He's got knight d7, and then plays knight f6. And there's all kinds of ways black can play this. And not very many of them are very fun for white. Um, yeah, no, I think you're right that um, just taking here is probably fine. And then going into this, um, what I don't particularly like, I, I can do this. Um, I just don't think this is very fun for white here. The Panov is fine. The Panov's good and well and fine. But this particular Scandinavian line is quite annoying. Um, so, I know because I used to study it a little bit too. Um, there's just no way for either player to get a decisive edge here. 
Well, no, not just that, but the lines are pretty forcing, and if you deviate, you're going to get a worse position. It's just kind of a law of this. Um, so I, I don't know, I just need to really spend more time studying the Karokan and trying to find an idea I'm comfortable with. And probably doing that's going to involve learning all the G4 theoretical stuff. I'm trying to keep on top of the theory in the hopes that an opponent will actually allow it. Um, and then they won't. They'll play something else. But at least I'll be prepared for this. Um, yeah, no, I mean, if you played that particular position a lot, it's good for standard chess. It's frustrating as hell for blitz chess and bullet not that i even play much bullet but for even for blitz it just takes forever for white's pieces to coordinate toward any kind of meaningful attack because black is all bunched up and ready to exchange pieces at any moment to try to relieve the cramp of the position and white has to keep the space advantage in the cramp there otherwise it just doesn't amount to anything so it takes a lot of really precise moves on White's part to get anything out of it. Um, yeah, so I probably just need to play the main line. Though, I don't know. So we saw here that this fantasy stuff I mean, if I'm going to play the fantasy, I need to play bishop c4. Even though he hasn't taken on d4, this is still the thematic move here. I was spooked by this possibility. I'm sure it's nothing to be afraid of, but it's there at any moment. Um, at this moment, d4 is actually hanging, so something needs to be done about that. Um, like c3. Actually, this isn't so bad. I know I was speaking earlier that this is unclear um, and not liking it because I've moved my f-pawn. Obviously, the g4 lines would be even more dangerous. The main line is pretty much worked out to a draw. Um, the Panov is okay. It's, I don't know. Also, what I need to work on is just a uh, Scandinavian period. Um, I don't know, it's just... How do I improve upon my theory? Yeah, it could be that I have the G4 line confused with like a Sicilian G4 line. Oh, what was it? There's a King's Indian attack line where this knight ends up on g3 and white pushes h5. That's a Samish thing, if I remember right. No, that can't be right. This, the knight ends up on f3 in the Samish. Yeah, I don't know. But overall, I just don't think e4 is something I should be playing if I'm not prepared for a Karo, if I'm not prepared for a Sicilian, if I'm not prepared for a French, if I'm not prepared for a Scandinavian, I should just not be playing e4. I should be playing something else. I don't want to play the London like I used to play. Um, don't want to go back to the bird. And maybe the English is something for my temperament, but it's just really hard. It doesn't work well for bullet, <laughs> which is a stupid reason to pick an opening, but um, it doesn't work well for blitz either. For a while I was actually playing the spike here on Lee Chess, that was good fun. Um,
I mean, I could always play knight f3, and then if they play d5, then we figure out where to go from there. Probably d4. But if I'm going to allow all these transpositions, maybe d4 needs to be my main opening again. It just doesn't seem very fun for Bullet, though, but... Okay, what really caught me off guard, I guess, is that my opponent, in a Bullet game, plays the Karo Khan. That takes nerves. That takes a lot of really strong nerves to play this kind of thing in a Bullet game. Because... I mean, it's... You're not going to win this in under 40 moves. Um, not unless your opponent plays just like I played. Um, yeah, maybe I just need to study more Panoff games and more Scandinavian games. Um, Or maybe I need to find some innovative resource like Queenie 2. This kind of works in a French, but not really. In a Kiro, I'm sure it's just horrendous. Um, actually, the thing that Zug played the other day was interesting. Something about, like, I don't know. Is it knight f... and then bishop f5, queen f3? No, it wasn't queen f3 here. It wasn't queen f3 here either, because knight f6 would be... I don't know, I'll have to look into whatever the hell that was. Oh, uh, yeah, no. I... If you want to learn openings, um, pretty much any other chess player can teach you openings. I mean, yeah, I'm rated like 2,000 on this site. Yeah, I have an over-the-board rating of over 1,900. But if you look at my tournament games over the board, pretty much most of them I'm on the verge of getting checkmated in every game. And I just pull off some miracle save. Um, so, if you want to learn how to play quality things, uh, other streamers do better with that. In particular, <laughs> it's kind of funny, but um, uh, National Masters, well, I guess Amazingoid does pretty fantastic work, as does uh, National Master uh, John Chernoff, going by the name of Zug Addict. They do a lot of really good pedagogy about how to play chess. Um, yeah, no... I'll show you this game, because you probably missed it here. I just played this game, by the way. So this is admittedly an adventurous opening selection on my part. Um, so by move 7, I've already dropped a pawn. My king is weak. I've, I have succeeded in castling. And I've almost managed to develop all my pieces. Um... And so here I kind of hastily grab a pawn, and probably shouldn't have done that. Probably should have continued development. So I continue my development, and now he's harassing my king, and I'm dropping a second pawn. And I didn't think he would take it. Um, actually, he didn't take it. To his credit, he just keeps his pieces centralized. And now he gets a half-open g-file for his rook, and I couldn't exploit this. Like, this whole position looks... Artificially, it looks great for white. If white can actually manage to get any pieces onto the h-file, there could be something here. But for that to happen, uh, it's just not happening. Um, because black's knight can get over there too quickly. So, I don't know. You want to learn chess? Don't follow my example. <laughs> Uh, Alright, so we got a Karo line here. Our line we're discussing is d4, d5, knight c3, d4, 
Knight e4, bishop f5, knight g3, bishop g6, h4, h6, knight f3. Yeah, I couldn't remember if this h5 first or knight f3 first. I think both have been played. Um, knight d7, h5, bishop h7. Uh, oh yeah, and then the bishop exchange. Because this bishop... For a while, um, masters were not exchanging bishops here. And then they realized that white's bishop really can't achieve more than what black's is achieving. Black's bishop is developed outside the pawn chain. like So it is controlling lots of squares, even if it's not the longest diagonal on the board. It's pretty long, and that's a really good bishop, so white exchanges for it. Um, but this kind of relieves black's cramp. And what is white really playing for here? Um, yeah, now this is the main line though. Bishop e7, knight e4. I'm not so sure I follow knight e4. Um, knight f6, queen d3, castle. King b1, c5. g4. So that's the g4 you're talking about. Um, yeah, and no, I actually have seen this mentioned before. I've not looked very closely at it. Um, obviously, black has to take this, because, um, I mean, alternative would maybe be knight h7, trying to barricade this square. But I just don't see that ending well with f4 and g5 coming anyway. So, taking g4 seems sensible, but yeah, white's got quite a bit of firepower. On the other hand, um, why does black doing taking on e4? Like, these moves bishop e7 and knight takes e4 seem awfully generous. Um, yeah, I think knight f6 is the main line, but then, then from here, I'm struggling to remember what black usually does. I think, yeah, it is bishop e7, but knight takes e4? Really? This seems crazy. Yes, it does help relieve Black's cramp ever so slightly, but um, that knight on e4 isn't going to g5. I just don't know why... I guess I don't see a better move. Like... Playing c5 is hard to build up to. Playing a5 doesn't act very quickly. Um, yeah, no, I think the book I read by an expert or a master, I forget who, recommends castle here. Um, I could be mistaken. What do the masters play in this position? The chess... Do I have the masters database open? I do. Um, overwhelmingly, uh, players prefer knight takes knight. Okay. And then knight f6, queen e2, queen d5. But that's not what we were pursuing here. What you were suggesting was knight of six, queen d3, and then g4 is coming. Um, but black could play queen d5 here, it says. Um, honestly, well, no, I think my book did suggest castle here. Um, but might not have gone into the detail of what happens in this variation. 
Um, yeah, I've seen a couple games with that variation. Um, it's been a long time for sure, but I'm just questioning why not just develop another piece? Is there something so wrong with queen d5 here? Um, c4 seems natural, and then offer a queen exchange. Queen b3, b5. I might have seen this position before. I'm not remembering. Oh, queen e2 can force an endgame. I hear the word endgame. Um... Uh, if I'm hearing the word endgame, this this is sounding pretty good now. Um, although, wait, no, I've studied this. I tried to find interesting resources for wolf players, and it's just, yes, the position's playable, yes, there's things to play for. No, I don't like this position. <laughs> it's... There just aren't enough pieces on the board, and at the same time, there are too many pieces. Um, if there were fewer rooks on the board, then maybe, maybe that could be fun. If there were more open files, that could maybe be fun. Um, with just so many pieces on the board, and no clear plan for either player to get a passed pawn, it's just sad. Um, yeah, so queen d3 makes a lot more sense, in um, my opinion. Um, but, yeah, I think the book I was reading only considered queen e2. So, knowing that this is a possibility is useful. Um, queen b3, b5 looks sharp. So there's stuff to play for here, is the point. Um, so if you're playing this, you're also booked up on what happens if black castles and you just play the g4 stuff. You're probably also booked up on other stuff too. And then there's the possibility you might not even get these positions, except against a very well-prepared opponent. So, as a matter of practical uh, study, um, um, what would be a reasonable cutoff here? I don't know, I just... Yeah, even going for the Scandinavian looks more manageable in terms of studying and learning stuff. And being able to play an actual game. Um, I mean, yeah, if you're playing as a chess professional, you could study that stuff and um, probably get your way through it. But as an amateur, if you're not committed to learning all that, um, try to find something a bit more manageable. Like, I do play the fantasy in my tournament games and it's okay I wasn't prepared for bishop g5 before pawn takes pawn usually the move order is pawn takes pawn first and then bishop g4 um, I have to think more about this but ultimately I might end up going for that pan off stuff and um, Scandinavian stuff because I'm the way that this game proceeded even after doing some post-mortem I don't like this with white not having enough pawn and being down a tempo essentially the attacking chances were kind of fun while that lasted but it looks like um, a well-prepared black can do well against this without much trouble at all Yeah, and because the g4 attack plays itself out so nicely, you just know that an opponent's not going to let you do that. They're going, I mean, they might, 
And so because they might, you have to spend all that time studying, okay, here's how the G4 games go, and if my opponent reacts this way and comes up with this idea, here's our all, all the ideas I might have at my disposal. If they come up with a different idea, then here's all the other ideas I have. And so you could figure out all these long-term objectives based on that particular pawn formation. Uh, commit that to memory, and just know that that's never going to come up, but if it does come up, you're prepared against it. Or not study it. Risk that they might prepare it against you and come up with some nasty side variation that is just difficult to counter. I mean, yeah, your attack kind of plays itself, but if your opponent's well prepared, they're not going to lose. Um, and there's a wide variety of things Black can do, even though he is kind of cramped. Um, just in terms of pawn levers and ways he can activate his pieces and targets he could potentially hit. He can go all over the board. He's not committed to any one particular idea, but his position's worse. But worse is not the same as lost, it just means it's complicated. So you're stuck with the dilemma of do I study all this knowing that my opponent's probably not going to let me play it, but if they do play it I'm ready. Or do you pick something simpler and more manageable and say I'm not a professional chess player, I don't need to memorize all this stuff that I'm never going to see. I'd rather try to get a reasonable opening position, and even if I don't know exactly what's going on, it can get at least kind of a fun game going. It's kind of the approach I've been trying to take, but I don't have the theory to even support that because I haven't put in the time for it. But uh, we'll figure it out. Um, oh yeah, but sure, if they let you play g4, it's great. But in that other line where you play your queen over to b3 and they play b5, I've studied that a little bit. I've seen that before. It freaked me out looking at it because it's just very sharp and theory can evolve quickly. Um, I mean, yes, there is some objective truth to what's going on there, but... Um, I don't know, good luck learning all of it, in particular against anything that black might throw at you with it. What if they don't play b5? What if they play a5 first? What if they castle? What if all these various things? And you have to have some idea of what all the key principles are in that position. I'm sure it's good for white. It's just complicated. And as best as I could tell, white wins a pawn in some lines. And black gets a ton of counterplay. And it doesn't seem like white's ever the aggressor there. It's just really frustrating. Yeah, and I, I mean, I've looked at that. I haven't found anything. And I think, just as a practical matter, I'm not going to spend time studying things that move 15, and move 20, and move 25. When I can look back here at like move 3 and move 4 and see is there something practical I can do just so I can get a chess game. Um, and then okay if I do decide to go professional with this and for some reason I'm crazy enough to do that then we'll explore the objective truth of all these variations 15 moves down the road, 20 moves, 25 moves and so on. Learn all these end games figure out appropriate ways to play the middle game based on which end games we're aiming towards, figuring out which piece exchanges that we should be encouraging and discouraging, what plans I have in this, how my opponent might react to everything, and just learning practical skills in terms of time management with various positions. And, I mean, you can learn all that, but if you're not going professional, if you're just playing as an amateur, Find something that's fun for you. And, okay, maybe memorizing these things, memorizing all these middle games and end games might be fun for you. It's not for me. Um, 
Yeah, well, I don't know if you've actually played in competitive events. I've been paired with experts and masters before, and it's brutal. You don't want to be left hung out high to dry just because your opponent is better prepared than you are um, for whatever you've prepared. Experts and masters are actually pretty good at the game. Um, so it's for reasons like that that I try to take this opening stuff a little bit seriously. Even though online I don't take it as seriously, but I'm just saying in terms of theoretical value, um, you can't just say, oh, I watched a video, or oh, I read a book, and isn't this wonderful? That could be a fun way to start to explore something. But in terms of making a more committal decision, you don't want to just do it that way. Um, Oh, that's cool. Well done. Yeah, my my track record against experts and masters is pretty terrible. Um, they tend to outbook me, outplay me in the middle game, and then grind me down in the end game. So usually by the time I start to play well, we're like 20 to 30 moves into the game. My position's already beyond anything that anybody would ever want to try to defend. Um, beyond anything you would find in any textbook. Even those that tell you, oh, look at how wonderful this master game was and how instructive it is and how he just crushed his opponent. My positions are worse than that. Um, um, it's because I try to do all these really ambitious things that I shouldn't be aiming for. I'm always pushing the envelope and um, not really showing much wisdom there. Um, it can be fun, but it's exhausting. Yeah. And, I mean, even against players that are like 600 points lower rated than myself, I still tend to get almost wiped off the board in the opening and middle game because I'm always trying something super ambitious. But, um, like, I, I'm not even playing the main lines either. I've tried playing main lines and... My opponents, even lower rated ones, know all this stuff, and it's ridiculous. And that makes no absolutely no sense, and players rated like 1400 and such, or I guess maybe 1600 would are the ones I'm talking about, but these people just know ridiculous gobs of theory, and they'll blitz it all out, and you'll be like 20 moves into a game and neither player has any winning chances and so you just shuffle the pieces for another hour or two shake hands and go have lunch and it's like where's the fun in that anymore um so i don't know my Tournament games tend to go far more on the imaginative side than that. Um, I try to avoid all that stuff and try to play something more innovative, more creative, something less well explored. Um, something that forces both players to think and actually play a damn game. Um, and so. Like, as black, sometimes I'll just play, the, like, the king's, uh, not king's gambit decline, the king's Indian defense. I'll play that. Sometimes I play the Grunfeld. Sometimes I play just normal e4, e5 stuff. Lately, I've been trying to pick up the Benko. Um, so. Yeah, unfortunately my chat window's not connected to my uh, streaming PC, so I can't just bring up the game. 
Um, that's okay. We don't have to go look at every possible Caro game. I'm just saying that the way I play is just entirely contrary to what you're suggesting. And while that might be good practical advice for a lot of players, it just won't work at all for me. Um, like, I would sooner, um, rather than play all that Caro theory, I would sooner just play the bird. I would do that. Just completely avoid the Caro stuff. Avoid the Scandinavian. Not entirely avoid the Sicilian, because they can still play this. And, it's really annoying. Um, but also, I've got... Um, I know some people who will play this. And this is fun stuff, too. Um, I forget if even this is playable here. But, like, there's all kinds of ways you can play more interesting stuff. Um, and I don't know. Chess is complicated. Um, I had a tournament opponent play G4 against me. Um, and so I forget. Um, I think I played D5. Look, even I can't remember my first move of the game. It's pretty sad. Um, and I forget if it went like bishop g2 and I just played e5. But yeah, here I avoided... I mean, this is theoretical. There's all this stuff going on here, but... Um, I played something ambitious against this but not something overly committal, like in terms of just snapping the pawn and losing this stuff out here. So, I don't know, when I play I do ratchet up the tension quite a lot. Um, yeah, now the grob might, very well might be something I should be playing. I'm not even joking at this point, just because I don't know, I don't want to face this stuff. Either that or I've got to look at more pan off bop games. Like a hundred or two hundred more games than I've looked at. Um, try to figure out what's interesting about it. And then, if it is interesting, then maybe that's the sort of thing I want to play. Um, but I don't want to play something where pieces get exchanged. Um, unless there's a favorable endgame. But an endgame where both players have seven pawns, no queens, and two rooks apiece, and then some minor pieces, either with or without the minor pieces, doesn't really matter. There's, like, no chances for a breakthrough, there's no chances for a mating attack, no chances for a passed pawn and that sort of thing. No is a slight overstatement, but you get the idea that just that sort of position um, it's very difficult to win without any kind of pawn breaks. It's difficult to get a good um, end game when both players have two rooks. It's possible, but do you really want to play that sort of position? 1b3. I've actually tried that before. Um, I think ultimately what didn't work so well with this was d5. And okay, sure, you take this long diagonal. And I think to some degree e5 was okay too, but um, this is one player who plays g6 against everything. Uh, I think I did try this once. Even this didn't pan out so well. Um, I mean, this is fine for white. Uh, the G pawn's a bit overextended. You don't have to play G4. Um, but no, I think the thing I didn't like about this was just possibility of playing D5. 
And then, okay, yes, you've developed the bishop. You're hitting this G pawn. Um, I forget how this goes. Oh, right, this. And then, well, hang on. You don't have to do that either. You could just do knight f6 here. Well, it's not going to take because we end up backing Karo like territory. Um, so. Yeah, well, the fast h4, h5 creates a huge endgame weakness. And against a well prepared opponent, you're not going to mate in the opening. And that doesn't apply nearly as much pressure as like a g4, g5 push would. Although I'm sure that's supported in that particular position. But, um, I don't know. Like, why play b3 if you're going to play h4, h5? Why not just play this? And then just play h4. That gives a fast h4, h5. Why bother putting in b3 at all? In fact, your bishop is better targeting this square over this way. The advantage to playing b3 is that you have this pressure on the long diagonal, but um, that acting by itself isn't enough. This certainly applies pressure. Um, but again, I, I don't think this approach of just learn a move, oh, and then just learn the next move, and learn the next move, I don't think that's going to work for me. I have to find games and games that are interesting, and I, it's great that you're linking to a game or two, but I've got to like look through like hundreds of expert and master games and try to find something that's inspiring and try to emulate that. Because this effort I'm going on of trying to run on my own theory or trying to just like look at one game and then play something and say, oh, look, I came up with this system all by myself just doesn't work very well. Or this concept of, I'm going to read a book. This book's going to feature a game or two in each variation, and that's going to be that. That also doesn't work very well. You have to find some either player, or some tournament, or country, or club, or some kind of style that you want to emulate. Um, some kind of source that you can continually draw upon for ideas, so you're not coming up with all the ideas on your own. Because coming up with all the ideas on your own and trying to refute everything that other people are suggesting is just exhausting, as opposed to following a player and following their style, which a lot of players do, and it works quite well. Um, right, no, but you know the things you're playing for by looking at a variety of games, not just one game, not just a line, um, it's a lot larger effort, and it takes time, and it, it just seems silly just to say, well, here's a variation, this is what you're aiming for, and end of conversation there. Um, you really need a corpus of games called together by stronger players. Um, um, and you need to find a kind of style that you want to emulate. You can't just put an idea out there or put a game out there. It's just not enough. You need to have something that's much more rigorous. Yeah. Well, I mean, playing for d5 is a key idea in the Sicilian. Uh, exchange sacrifice on c3 is a key idea in the Sicilian. Um, Activating all of your pieces, putting your rooks on c8 and d8 is a key idea. There's all kinds of key ideas. It really depends what variation you're going for. Um, a Taimanov and a Khan Sicilian and an Eidorf and all these various variations have different key ideas. And it's great that Fisher can be a pinhead like that and just say it all. it's all about d5. Or just sack, sack, mate. He was joking when he said that. It's not that simple. Um, but yeah, once you've established your corpus of games, 
and you've looked at all these things that the strong players have done, you can try to emulate that and take from that these are the key ideas that players know about, which is different than these are all the key ideas in a position. Because even if you look at modern tournaments, you'll find that uh, top-level players are innovating all the time. And that's an enormous investment of effort on their part to do that. Um, there's a lot of shadow boxing that takes place to avoid other people's innovations until there's enough time to prepare for uh, playing against them. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, we could go over to my profile. I'm, uh, yeah, my FIDE ratings 2014. Um, my US rating is like 1950 something, 1960, I don't remember. I haven't played much in terms of US rated tournaments lately, anyhow. And, I mean, I've beaten experts and I've beaten a master. Um, taught chess classes. Uh, uh, had some pretty strong results. So you're. It's not like you're teaching me something hugely innovative, unless you're yourself a master and I'm just dismissing your advice. I don't know. You're not teaching me things that I don't haven't already heard a hundred times, and I'm even arguing back against some of these ideas because they're oversimplified and often parroted and not well considered and these kinds of illusions about um, how to approach the game they do help people sell books they do help people um, sell chess courses and classes and DVDs and videos of other sorts but um, but they don't work well for a player uh, seeking long-term improvement. It takes a lot more work to progress um, with that sort of thing. You can't just say things and improve. You have to actually put in a lot of time and effort. Or if you're just looking to have fun, not put in as much time and as much effort, but just find something you might enjoy. Like here, this dodges... Um, dozens of books of theory. Uh, the downside is that you get this pan off by Vinic structure, um, which itself isn't a bad thing. Um, so near White's delaying playing knight f3. Um, trying to remember if g6 is playable here or not. I want to say that there's some problem with delaying that though. Like, I think now white has to play it anyway. So yeah, there's nothing to really improve upon there. Um, and then if bishop takes, you can't do queen takes because the pawn drops, so you have to take back this way. Um, which is to say that white shouldn't be delaying is development because if he delays the development then the d pawn is loose uh, without any kind of compensation. Um, but it also seems like white's down a tempo. Am I counting this wrong? How do we normally get into a pan on by Vinic? How does this normally occur? I my head's hurting. Yeah, no, I'm just saying the advice, while the advice, if you follow it to the very letter and you interpret it in the proper context and you're not overstating the importance of the advice with regard to the fact that you need to put in tons of effort to support it, yes, that kind of approach will help you. But it's tons of effort. Um, now, I, I thought there was another road to the Pan of Bavinic, though. I might be confusing this. Yeah, no, this... White's not down a tempo here. 
Um, I've seen people play bishop f5 too, but um, I've seen this recently, and this is just troubling. Um, I mean, black just plays this normally, he's okay, but... Um, and having doubled pawns is by no means the end of the world here. Um, it's okay. It's a position. White's got the bishop here. Um, white has very few endgame chances due to having so many pawn islands. There's weaknesses everywhere. Um, so white's chances lie in the middle game. Um, which is just difficult. Just to say that white shouldn't delay um, this knight f3 stuff. Should allow this pin and just play the main line here, where black usually plays e6, if I remember right. Um, this is a key point is that black hasn't played knight c6, and I suppose if he does here, I mean, yeah, there's pressure on d4. I think I've even seen this in a game before. But this is... Black's position's kind of creaking here, if I remember right. Yeah, this is not in the Masters... Am I even in the Masters database? Yes. Um, knight c3 is recommended here. I wonder why not bishop d3. I thought bishop d3 is a line. Um... Oh, that's right, cd5 here. But then why would black play um, knight c6 here? Well, I guess, yeah, black doesn't want to take on c4. So he plays knight c6, and then white has to take here, and it's okay for white. Yeah, I've actually played queen b3 in similar positions. I don't think it works so well here. Um, in an English opening, You'll often see like queen b3, queen b6, c5, forcing an exchange, and then pawn takes, exposing the rook on the a-file. But here, um, black doesn't have to go for any of that. He can take on either c4 or f3. I kind of like taking an f3 here. G takes is forced, and then, oh, knight takes. Well, that's not what I expected. Okay. Yeah, queen b3, evidently, pawn takes is something a master has played. Um, I don't know that I agree with this. I've seen it before. Heck, I've even played something almost exactly like this in a blitz game over the board. Um, though I think I played knight a5 here, and the master played knight d4. Knight d4 seems awfully ambitious. Um, it seems... That's okay. Um, oh yeah, black has to move his king. That's no fun now, is it? Yeah, it's... Either way, that's super sharp. And I like this bishop f3. Which got played in the other game. If, if you were looking at it. Um, but here black takes on d4, and okay, he's giving up b7, b7 with tempo, I guess, but you get, look at all this play he gets. Um, I've played an online game, I think, in this very line. As black, I think. Yeah, now this looks familiar, and then... I think I did sack and just try to develop. If it wasn't this position, it was one almost exactly like it. Though I don't think I played bishop d8 here. I think maybe I played g6. No, I can't do g6. What was it? What did I do here? Maybe it was h6 and king g8, king h7. Something quite like this. Not exactly this. 
But yeah, this is super dangerous. Um, and Black usually doesn't play this way. Usually ends up playing e6 before he can get in bishop g4. Um, but in lines where white plays knight f3, allowing bishop g4, the pin does not drop the d-pawn because white's counter play is too fast. There's a lot of ideas there. Um, I haven't managed to find one that, I don't know, I haven't managed to find any idea that satisfies, um, uh, I, I just, I want something different than what white normally gets out of this, which is like this, and then that, and you know, you see 47% draw, 43% draw, 43% draw, 50 something percent draw. This is just a very drawish opening. Very, very much like a Queen's Gambit declined, but um, here black has a half open C file to operate with. White has a half open E file. Uh, white has two pawn islands, black has two pawn islands, um, neither player has any passed pawns, neither player has any pawn levers, both players' kings are safe, both rooks are still on the board, there's not any knight for bishop imbalances, it's just very dry. Um, and the stuff that avoids this is all super ultra dangerous. So there's like no middle ground. You're either playing um, to lose or you're playing to draw. I've played that. It's just not very exciting. So that's why I'd go for this fantasy line. But this game, I panicked on the move order because I'm more accustomed to seeing pawn takes pawn and then bishop g4. Here he played bishop g4 first, and turns out I can play this even though he's got b5. B5 is ill-advised. Um, well, I guess in this position particularly because I just sack. Um, and they can take E5 and take the bishop. But um, in general, if the bishop's not hanging, um, I guess white sacks here anyway because the bishop's still hanging. Um, the black defends the square from the square can defend the bishop. Um, White's still got pretty good chances, even though this knight is going to kick the bishop. Or a knight might make it to e5 to kick the bishop, and it's just really annoying for White, but this is playable. Um, even this has a pretty high drawing margin. Um, but seeing this line seeing that black can actually play this accurately um i don't know it's making me go back up the stack a bit higher and just like think if i do see this over the board first of all i'm not prepared for other openings like you could play c5 and if we go into a Sicilian, um, uh, takes, takes, knight f6, knight c3, a6. I'm not prepared for this. I shouldn't be playing e4. This isn't my tournament repertoire. Maybe someday I'll be prepared for this. I'm not at all ready for that. I do have something prepared for it, but it's not good. I just played g3. Dodges like all the theory and just gets a familiar position. Something where both players have something to play for. And uh, it's not the greatest for white. It's not terrible though. Uh, often I've seen players just react instinctively here, and that's okay. Just play a game. There's a lot to play for here. Um, there's a lot of chances for both players, but I'm not prepared for that. I'm not prepared for most of these things that could happen in the Sicilian. Um, 
So for my actual tournament repertoire, I don't want to play e4. I don't want to play f4 because it's just bad. And g4, um, it's risky. Ultimately, I mean, most opponents won't have all the book stuff prepared for it, but many of them will, and you don't want to risk that. The English still seems like my best bet in terms of getting something that I can study, that there are plenty of expert and master games in, that there's a variety of ways that white can play it and a variety of ways black can play it. Um, the only downside is it doesn't entirely jive with my style of being very super aggressive. It does involve some more positional play, but long term that will serve me better than, say, trying to force a particular variation of the Karo Khan to work for me. So, rather than selecting a variation because it's good, selecting something because there are just plenty of games to support it, and I find the positions interesting, and um, even if it's not the best opening, at least it's something that I can look at expert and master games for. Um, and understand that the theory is not going to change overnight. Yeah. So I still think that English is probably the best way for me to go. Um, I mean, I've taken up d4 on a number of occasions. I've not found anything they're as happy with. People just throwing out opening names and variations aren't isn't going to help me either. I need to still find collections of games and such that um, would encourage me to think that uh, there was anything there that I wanted to play, but there's just so many variations after d4. In particular, as black, I'm starting to pick up some d4 openings, um, and I just don't find it very appealing for white. So I still think the English offers me the greatest flexibility, however, uh, one problem with the English is that you get this. And then guess where you end up back at? Well, it's not exactly a Panna of Bavinic. Um, but, I mean, there's this. And again, this is the way to avoid the Panna of, but you can end up in a Panna of if you don't avoid that. Um, there are independent theoretical lines here, too. Um, I'm trying to remember. There's some lines somewhere involving queen b3. This might be it. Uh, this has independent theoretical value. But yeah, this stuff can crop up pretty much anywhere. Um, so one attempt to dodge some of that would be to play knight f3, but then my problem here is that um, after d5, I wouldn't want to play d4. I'd much rather play e4 or c4. Um, and I have played c4 in this position before, and it's just not as f so fun. Um, Yeah, I don't really have a favorite opening position, unless you count, like, every position where I'm completely, com totally dead lost, which seems to be my preference. Um, I'm always pushing the envelope. Um, so, chances are, if you're in a tournament hall, and you're looking at all the boards in the hall, and just trying to figure out which player is losing the most after the first 10 or 15 moves. Then you go around and look at all the boards. The one where the player is just getting completely wiped off the board would be me. Um, but generally what happens is that my opponents get these ginormous winning advantages and then have no idea whatsoever how to convert them. Um, I had a tournament, I think it was a five round event, uh, I think all five rounds, um, an engine looked at my game and said that I was somewhere between minus three and minus five 
after the first 15 moves of every game. And um, I won four of those games and drew the other one. Just to give you an idea. So, I'm not... I want to say I'm not exaggerating, but every a lot of people do tend to exaggerate. How do you do that? You get really complicated positions. You push things far beyond the point of reason and then keep pushing. Um, and you don't give up when you're lost, you just keep attacking. And balance that with the fact that you have to defend things too. Um, yeah, no, in a tournament game, I don't know, it's either my opponents just start taking me for granted or I don't know what, but um, when I do play in team tournaments, all my teammates freak out uh, just looking at my games. Yeah, it's, I want to say I do something like Tall does, but Tall does it way better. Um, I just get a bad position. His games were at least unclear and very difficult. Um, my positions, usually all sorts of things are hanging everywhere. Both kings are under attack or both sides are threatening to promote and just all kinds of insane races occur as pieces are hanging and tactics are flying everywhere. Um, that tends to be what happens in my tournament games. Um, and I think if I had a better theoretical grounding, I wouldn't have to go to such extremes to get a position that I could play. I think if I were to study more expert and master games, like I've been suggesting, it's not the matter of just finding an opening. It's a matter of finding a model to follow. Um... Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of players, um, eighteen hundred and below, tend to get lulled into a sense of security when they've got a much better position. Um, problem is when I get paired against players over eighteen hundred, that's when things get difficult. But anyway, I just keep saying, like, all this pithy advice about just pick a variation or pick an opening. It's just about the right selection. No, it really isn't. It's about finding uh, models to emulate and finding um, uh, well-annotated games, or even if they're not annotated, finding just collections of games by people who consistently perform well, or if not even people, just games where many players have come up with many interesting ideas and just take some time to read through those and appreciate them. And this is what masters do. This is like when you watch um, National Master Chernoff or Zug Addict's stream, he knows what he's talking about. He knows these games inside and out, and it's just crazy. And I can't even begin to remember uh, half the things that he does. I don't know how he manages to do it. Um, what openings do I play for both sides? Well, with white, uh, with white I usually play either f4, e4, c4, or d4. Um, with black I usually play e5, against e4, or a Sicilian against e4, or, um, well, I guess it's usually one of those two. Against d4, I usually play either a King's Indian Defense, or a Grunfeld, or, uh, lately a Benko, or, uh, I've been trying to learn the Slav, too. Obviously, you can see that, like, I'm just not satisfied with the openings I'm finding, and I need to find, like, Rather than reading through books and DVDs and such, and I've been doing all that and watching videos, and it's just not helping at all. 
what I need to do is find um, collections of expert and master games and see how it is that strong players deal with real problems in real games and see if anything can be learned from that. Um, I haven't followed Morozovich, no. Yeah, uh, certainly about finding a comfort zone. I, I'm, to some extent, that's what I found, is just like, not in any particular position, but just overall, how far am I willing to go making positions completely insane, and just what's that balance that I'm going to strike between end game possibilities versus middle game possibilities and attack versus defense and kingside versus queenside and all that sort of balance sort of stuff. It's all that metagaming stuff that I'm doing okay in tournament games. It's just that the actual moves I play suck. Um... um Which openings do I know well? Um, again, I don't think it's a matter of like knowledge, but um, the one I do know really well would be the Italian game. Um, in particular, this stuff, e4, e5, knight of three, knight c6, uh, bishop c4, bishop c5, c3, knight f6. This stuff I know well. But that's kind of immaterial because no opponent's going to go into this. Um, this I do know, but what's the point? We're not going to see this in an actual game. Uh, I mean, you saw even earlier today I had a tournament game on Lee Chess here that went um, very similar to this, but my opponent copped out before we could get into the main theory of it. Um, and it's just sharp. You don't want to get pinched with that. But And then, yeah, against Zug, um, we've played the Frankenstein Dracula quite a bit. He knows it way better than I do, which is crazy because I spent forever trying to bust it in terms of what he plays. And I haven't been able to bust it yet. Um, I know you can't bust that opening, but even trying to find some kind of weakness in what he plays has been quite an arduous adventure. Um, I did win a Frankenstein Dracula tournament. It was pretty cool. Um, like if you look, got tournament points. We got best results. Second best tournament ever. Um... So you see like two, two, four, 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 whatever. Played some sleepless morning. So it's like not even me playing my best effort. Um but just completely wiping the floor with everybody because they don't know it anyway. But um I guess comparatively speaking, I haven't put so much time into this. I know, as I say, I spent some time trying to bust this, but I'm overstating my effort here. Um, and a lot of the players here don't have nearly the same Lee Chess rating that I have, so... This is kind of an overstated result. Um, it still looks cool. And this is why I argue that Lee Chess... I don't know thematic tournaments are useful. Um, so a player could really study and get the hang of an opening. Um, I do encourage other people to do these. Because um, if you pick anything other than this one, probably you'll beat me. But this one... You know, if they could just make chess start in this position, that would be great. If all chess games could start from this opening, how wonderful would chess be? It's not going to happen, is it? But yeah, general advice is not going to help. I just need to actually put in the time and the effort. 
It's not about memorizing a variation. It's not about finding the right opening. It's about finding an approach to the game that isn't completely exhausting, where you're not coming up with all of your own ideas. And, I mean, I've even had some level of coaches in coaching before, and while that's useful and great in its own thing, it, it's no substitute for real work. Um, and that's really what the game becomes, if you want to take it seriously like you're all suggesting. And I'm not saying that I'm taking it seriously. I'm saying that if I wanted to go ahead and try to go professional with the sort of thing, which really I'm not aspiring toward this time, um, then I would need to put in the time and study the expert games and master games. And I think that's the point that we're all bypassing here. Thinking that, oh, it's just a matter of finding the right opening, or it's a matter of finding some player who played a game well once, and or some author who wrote a book about some players who did well. And No, it's really about more just finding a better appreciation for how people have learned to play the game better. Finding appreciation for um, learning how players played in the 1800s, how they played in the 1900s, how they played in the uh, 2000s. Seeing how chess style evolves from tournament to tournament and so forth. Um, yeah, no, I, I just don't think that any one sentence or any one piece of advice is any substitute for uh, the sort of work that actual chess masters have put in. I mean, just... It's incredible. Um, and I, I think it goes so unappreciated by people who are watching John as he does his stream. They don't realize just how much work he's put in. And he just did it for fun. Not getting the master title for fun, but just learning how the masters played he, he just says he enjoys looking at master games and that's wonderful and great for him that he that's so fulfilling for him and it's great that he's able to recall all these things and he has such a great memory for it um i, I it's it's amazing that he's such a resource in that arena <laughs> uh filthy sea bass is still here uh yeah well it's not just 10,000 hours because i've probably put in at least double that it's 10,000 uh hours of serious focused effort uh with a routine that's well established and a regiment and an approach and all that stuff you need you need not just to put in the time, but also the effort. Um, and it, and the discipline, really. And lately I've just found it much more rewarding to work with like chess variants and software development. I found that much more interesting than trying to increase my rating. Um, I'm sure with the time and the effort and energy, I could put out some results that are better than when I put it forward, but that's, it just doesn't seem like the best um, investment of my time right now. But we can still play for fun and still point out things to uh, newer players. So there's still that. There's still things to aspire to. Not everybody has to be a master. And I'm sure later on if I find myself with an abundance of time and nothing else to pursue, that might be a thing worth pursuing. Um, but right now it's just more fun to play the game and see where it goes. Um, so throughout all this I've been pretty exhausted, honestly. Um, yeah, this stream went on several hours longer than I thought it would. And most of it's been just me talking and us talking here. Um, 
I guess I do apologize for that for people who are looking for a game. Um, I did mention a long time ago that no, I just wanted to play one more game and wrap it up, and I am actually sticking to that. So I'm sorry if uh, people got a different impression. Um, so let's just look at a game. Let's see how this goes. Um, here we got Master Dalranj versus True War. So yeah, we'll see how this goes and um, call it there. So, I was going to say it looks like both players have a bishop pair, except black doesn't have a bishop pair. Just to give you an idea of where my mental state is at the moment, um, it's not at the point where I can offer very strong commentary, but I can try to entertain. There's that. Um... So, uh, material count is, wait, black has a knight for two pawns? I guess that's what the count says um, on the right, but I was just looking on the board to try to verify that. Um, trying to just exercise my ability to see if I can count the material correctly. Oh. Wow, I did not expect white to exchange rooks there. Um, that makes this a lot more challenging uh, for white to hold. Generally, when you're the defender in this sort of situation, you want to keep the pieces on the board and exchange as many pawns as possible to reduce your opponent's ability to um, promote. Okay, I guess that's safe. Bishop takes h-pawn is always a little bit of a gamble because there's some risk the bishop might get trapped. But here that's such a small risk. Um, on the other hand, because the h-pawn wasn't going very far, taking it is a waste of time. And white strives to capitalize on that as quickly as possible. Um, unfortunately for white, he didn't play the rook to the b-file, and so I don't, I'm not sure that that was even possible, but um, yeah, white's position just falls apart. He didn't have to drop the rook, um, but with the rook in front of the pawns and the pawns not supporting each other and with the frontmost pawn attacked and the base of the pawn chain also attacked and white having no way to defend both of them um that's how that fell apart white needed to do better making sure his pawns supported each other as they were racing down the board and that's a bit of a tricky thing to do while your only rook that you have left is also trying to keep the black king away from the pawns. But what you're supposed to do in that sort of situation is exchange as many pawns as possible, even if that means giving away your chance of promoting a pawn to victory. Um, so, for those who stuck around, uh, hope you had fun. Maybe we'll learn more next time. Maybe we'll do some puzzles or something. Um, I'll keep trying to improve my stream layout and see if I could select a better board or better set or something. I do still like this. I wish there were something that looked a little bit more like a tournament set with like darker t squares. With like dark green uh, colored squares and I don't know something that more looked like um, the plastic sets that we use um, yeah 
Sorry, no title today. That's just me watching a game. Yeah, a title would come if I put in lots and lots and lots of effort and time. Um, and had a more um, rigorous routine about it. That's probably not happening anytime soon. So unless the U.S. Chess Federation feels like gifting me a title for some reason, it's probably not going to happen anytime soon. On the other hand, at least you can have fun uh, developing software that can um, win all kinds of international tournaments and stuff. So there's that. That's a fun collaboration to work on. Um, still fun helping people better understand their errors in their games um, and developing better training tools to train players honestly it's more exciting than myself training myself um, i know i repeated the word myself but i just couldn't pick up with a better way to describe it anyway um looks like these players are just going to exchange everything down and probably the national master is going to win a pawn somewhere and then win on time and that'll be that so hope you had fun watching and i guess hope to see you next time uh take care and have a good night